Dig this, mes amis. Your average Joe has never seen a film like today's experiment. Your average person on the street has not even begun to conceptualize the horror, which is your experiment today. I give to you Manos, the hands of fate. Push the button, Frank. Film is a magical art form. It can make you laugh, make you cry, and make you scream like almost nothing else can. This series is about films that make you do those things, sure, but it's mainly about films that make you say, What? Huh? Did they... Was that intentional? My name is Connor. I'm a filmmaker, educator, and connoisseur of terrible, terrible film. I'm here to be your guide to the realm of cinematic schadenfreude. It's Trashterpiece Theater, the very best of bad movies. Manos, The Hands of Fate, is what can be charitably described as a horror film, released in 1966. It was produced by a small troupe of actors and artists in Texas, most of whom had no formal filmmaking experience. Manos is a failure on almost every conceivable level. The script, the camera work, the audio, the editing, all fail to live up to even the most basic of acceptable standards. But even 50 years after its premiere, this film still carries with it a devoted fanbase and a rich, complicated legacy. As usual, we have to start at the beginning. And in this case, that means a man named Harold P. Warren. Harold Paul Warren, aka Hal, was an insurance broker and fertilizer salesman from El Paso, Texas. Not a whole lot is known about his early life, but it seems that at some point, he got bit by the acting bug and became a major player in the El Paso community theater scene. In the early 1960s, Warren made a walk-on appearance on an episode of the TV show Route 66, which was famous for being shot primarily on location all around the United States. That's where Hal Warren met the co-creator and screenwriter of the show, the awesomely named Sterling Siliphant. Siliphant would go on to win an Academy Award for writing In the Heat of the Night in 1967, but by the time Warren met him, he was probably best known for creating the police procedural series Naked City. The timeline is unclear and mostly consists of hearsay, but shortly before Manos was produced, Hal Warren and Sterling Siliphant met at a coffee shop and were chatting about films. At some point, Warren said that making a horror film couldn't be all that hard, and he made a bet that he could produce his own horror film by himself. According to legend, Hal Warren started sketching out the outline for what would become Manos The Hands of Fate on a napkin at that same coffee shop. Warren set about securing funding, locations, and cast members for his new film. By asking various local businesses, friends, and family members, he managed to cobble together a budget of $19,000, which is around 145 grand in 2018 money. He then founded his own company, Sun City Films, to produce the picture. Colbert Coldwell, a lawyer who worked in the same building as Hal Warren, agreed to let him shoot the film on his ranch outside of El Paso. And in mid-1966, principal photography began on Warren's new horror film, which had the working title, The Lodge of Sin, which was then changed to The Fingers of Fate, and finally Manos, The Hands of Fate. What follows is the stuff of B-movie legend. When you view this film for the first time, your brain almost immediately registers that something is terribly wrong. The opening shot just kind of starts. No opening titles, no production logos, just long, janky shots of El Paso and an elevator music soundtrack. Your suspicions about the film's quality are confirmed the second that the family of main characters start talking. About 12 miles from Highway 10, and that was Highway 10 back there. But you know, we should have asked for better directions at the last gas station. That's right, every single line of dialogue in this film was dubbed in post. We'll discuss that in more detail later, don't worry. Our main characters are a family on their way to something called Valley Lodge for a vacation. The family consists of Michael, played by director and writer Hal Warren, his wife Margaret, and their daughter Debbie, who despite being six years old, has the voice of a 30-year-old woman. Mommy, I'm cold. What follows is, no joke, nine minutes of the family aimlessly driving around looking for their destination. There are agonizingly long stretches where the shot just looks out at nothing in particular, and the only sound you are usually hearing is the extremely odd and out-of-place jazz score. 
Michael gets pulled over for having a broken taillight, but gets out of it because this is their first vacation. No excuse. Running late, first vacation, kid getting tired. That's too bad. Well, can't you give us a break, officer? Well, all right. The family driving around is broken up only with shots of a couple making out and drinking in a convertible. They get busted by the sheriff too, and then it's back to more driving. Finally, Michael and his family arrive at a strange house that we're led to believe has appeared from nowhere. It's here that they meet possibly the film's strangest and most celebrated character, Torgo. I am Torgo. I take care of the place while the master is away. Despite the incredibly odd and off-putting appearance of Torgo, Michael decides that the family will spend the night here, since they don't have time to reach Valley Lodge before it gets dark. There is no way out of here. It will be dark soon. There is no way out of here. So you have your standard travelers need to spend the night at a haunted house setup, which even in 1966 was already a huge cliche. To expand on this theme, a couple of spooky things happen once the family moves into the master's house. First, they discover a painting of a dude that looks a bit like Frank Zappa, who turns out to be the master himself. This painting might be the one even slightly creepy thing about the film. And to make totally sure you don't miss it, the film is going to constantly remind you about it. it looks so sinister. Must be the master himself. Oh, Mike, I'm scared. He has the meanest look. Shortly afterwards, a long howl is heard outside. At Margaret's insistence, Michael goes outside to see what's happening, inadvertently letting Debbie's dog Peppy out the door. Michael retrieves a revolver from his car, but discovers he is too late, and Peppy is dead. <gasps> My God, Mike, what happened? He's dead. Peppy's been killed. <gasps> The couple discuss what's happened and, in a shockingly logical turn of events, decide to leave immediately. But surprise, surprise, the car won't start. While Michael is outside trying to start the car, Torgo is making sex eyes at Margaret. He tells her that the master wants to take her as one of his wives, but that he won't let that happen because he wants Margaret for himself. He wants you for his wife. He loves beautiful women. There is some extremely awkward shoulder touching. After Margaret understandably rebuffs him, Torgo agrees to protect her from the master. Michael wants to call for help, but the nearest phone is 10 miles away, of course. After they determine that they are truly stuck for the night, Michael and Margaret look at the painting of Frank Zappa again, comment on how creepy it is, again, and then Debbie disappears and I... I just, just watch this. Darling, I sure hope so. She's my baby, she'll understand. Say, where is she? Oh my God, Michael! Amazing. Michael and Margaret go looking for Debbie and find her holding a big dog on a leash, the same one from the portrait. Ooh! Debbie leads them to a weird shrine behind the house, which is chock full of more hand imagery, brides of Dracula, and a sleeping man wearing dad sandals. Michael's reaction to all of this is to lock the girls inside the bedroom and then go find Torgo to ask him about it. Get in the bedroom and lock yourself in. I'm gonna find Torgo, he's got some explaining to do. Torgo rants and raves for a few minutes at the hand shrine, complaining about how the master has all the wives and he doesn't get any. There is more uncomfortable shoulder touching. After creeping on Margaret through the bedroom window, Torgo knocks out Michael with his hand staff thing and ties him to a tree. This plays out in real time and it's really hard to see anything and, well, it, it's rough. Meanwhile, the master awakens and the film makes it extremely f***ing clear that he is the guy from the painting. He starts monologuing about the great god Manos, then awakens his wives. They argue about what to do with Michael and his family, specifically about whether or not to kill Debbie. I have never complained about sacrificing a man, but a child? The woman is all we want. The others must die. The master decides to blame Torgo and his first wife for all of this for some reason. The wives continue to argue after the master leaves and then get so agitated that they start wrestling each other in the sand. Meanwhile, the master finds Torgo, I think, sleeping? On a pile of something in the corner of a room and initiates the most awkward dialogue exchange in cinematic history. The master calls out Torgo for being a creep to the sleeping wives. This happens. and the master marks Torgo for death. One of the wives frees Michael from his tree after doing this stuff to him. 
Completely unrelated note, I just want to remind you, this is the writer and director of the film. The master breaks up the fighting wives, who have apparently been wrestling for like 15 minutes, and prepares to sacrifice Tordro and his first wife. It's never made clear why the sacrifice is necessary other than, Mando has decreed it! So don't worry about it. In one of the film's most celebrated scenes, Tordro lays down on the slab and gets touched to death by the master's wives. <laughs> Then, since that surprisingly didn't get the job done, the master sets Torgo's hand on fire, which he finds unbelievably funny. <laughs> Michael meets up with Margaret and Debbie, and they start to run away into the desert while the master looks for them. Michael shoots at some stock footage of a rattlesnake. When Margaret can't run any further, they come up with the brilliant idea to run back to the house, since that's the last place they'd think to look for us. Plot twist, this doesn't work, and the master is waiting for them back at the house. Michael tries to shoot the master, it has no effect, and cut to black. Cut to a pair of women driving around aimlessly for several minutes in the Texas countryside. No, you're not hallucinating and the movie isn't recurving in on itself, it's still the same story. The two women find a mysterious house in the desert. I remind you, still the same story. It is revealed that Michael is now filling Torgo's role, and in a disgusting twist, Margaret and Debbie are now both wives of the master. I am Michael. I take care of the place while the master is away. Roll credits. So it's clear even from a brief summary that the story is a mess. And if you're seeing this footage for the first time, it's clear that the technical quality of Manos is lacking. So why did it turn out so bad? How can one film fail to meet just about every baseline expectation possible? The answers to those questions lie in the story of how the film was made. It's important to remember the leadership behind this project, that is to say, Hal Warren. Despite his bravado when making that bet with Sterling Siliphant, Warren had no filmmaking expertise to speak of. He did raise an impressive amount of money to fund the movie, but even for someone who knows what they're doing, $19,000 is not a lot of money to make a feature length film, even in 1966. That meant that some stuff had to be cut back. First of all, the cast and crew weren't paid. Jackie Naaman Jones, who played Debbie, was given a new bicycle as a gift for being in the movie, and the master's dog got a free bag of dog food. That's it. None of the actors were given any paychecks. Instead, Hal Warren promised each of them a cut of the proceeds from the film's theatrical run, which, as we'll come to discover, amounted to basically nothing. Cuts were made in the equipment department, too. Renting filmmaking equipment can easily be one of the most expensive parts of an independent production. Rob Guidry, the film's director of photography, shot the film with a 16mm film camera, a Bell & Howell 70DR. This is a spring-wound camera, meaning the operator has to wind up the camera's internal motor before every shot. Powered motors are available to allow the camera to run continuously, but the production either didn't have access to one or didn't have the money to rent it. That meant that the camera could run for at most 30 seconds or so without having to be wound up again. This meant tapes had to be short, and there wasn't much room for error. They didn't have much film to work with, I remember that. And there were a lot of things that were one-shot deals. You know, no repeats, no, oh, that didn't work out, let's do it, let's try again and go blah blah blah. In addition, a handheld camera like this one can hold a 100-foot reel of 16mm film, which, let's see, 40 frames per foot times 100 feet divided by 24 frames per second, you get 2 minutes and 45 seconds of shooting per roll. Film reels would have to be changed frequently during the production, causing further delays. Speaking of film, the entire project was shot with Ektachrome 16mm stock, which has an ASA, or or film speed of 25. ASA is the film equivalent of ISO on a digital camera. It's a numerical measure of the film sensitivity to light. The higher the number, the more sensitive the film is, and the brighter the picture will be by default. To give you an idea of how ridiculously dark this is, here's some footage of my living room shot with an ISO of 800 and an ISO of 25. This is on a bright sunny Florida day. So since ASA 25 is so stupidly dark, the production needed lots of bright light during its many nighttime scenes. Oh yeah, did I mention that all of these scenes were shot night for night because all of the actors had day jobs too? These shoots frequently took place from 9pm until 4 or 5 in the morning, and the bright light fixtures would attract hordes of moths to bother the actors, many of which can be seen in the final film. Tom Naiman, who played the master and was the father of Jackie Naiman-Jones, also served as the production designer for Manos. 
In addition to being an active part of the El Paso community theater scene, Naaman was also a multimedia artist. The sculptures in the house and at the master's tomb are his work. According to Naaman, he was going through a hands phase during the time of production. And they wanted me to provide some visual props for it. And guess what I had mostly on hand was hands. And that's why all the hands ended up in it in the various settings. And I said, well, why don't you call this thing Manos, the Hands of Fate? The master's wives were all hired from a local modeling school, which had the unfortunate name Mannequin Manor. One of the models, Joyce Muller, broke her foot early on in the production. Hal Warren responded by writing new scenes featuring a couple making out in a convertible so that Joyce could sit in the car without her cast being visible. This is why the convertible scenes have no bearing at all on the rest of the plot. John Reynolds, who played the role of Torgo, has perhaps the most tragic and strange story of them all. Anecdotal evidence suggests that in the original screenplay, Torgo was intended to be a satyr. He would have possessed a human top half and a goat bottom half. Tom Naiman constructed a rigging out of coat hangers and foam for Torgo. Torgo's legs. The intention was to create the illusion that they were bent backwards like a goat. John Reynolds wore the rig backwards for the entire movie and nobody once corrected him. The result is that Torgo appears more to have swollen knees rather than goat legs. A popular urban myth about the film suggests that the incorrectly worn rigging caused John Reynolds excruciating pain, which he treated with opioids. The legend states that that's why he looked so messed up in the movie, because he's taken too many painkillers. Casts that were on the set say this isn't accurate. According to the, his fellow cast and crew, John Reynolds happened to be doing LSD during the filming, or happened to be doing cannabis during the filming. This is perhaps a touch indelicate, but you can also just look at the poor guy to see that he's on something. Reynolds, by many accounts, had an extremely tense relationship with his father, who disapproved of his chosen profession. John reportedly used illicit substances to deal with the emotional pain of his family situation, and it's overwhelmingly likely that he was clinically depressed. Sadly, John Reynolds committed suicide about a month before the film premiered. He was just 25, and Manos was his only film role. The uncomfortable conditions of the shoot were exacerbated by the fact that Hal Warren was allegedly not all that great to work with. Take the experience of Diane Adelson, who performed the role of Margaret under the stage name Diane Marie. As production was starting, Hal Warren entered her into the Miss Texas beauty pageant. His logic was that he could promote the film more easily if he could bill its lead actress as Beauty Queen of Texas. Not a terrible leap of logic. The issue is that he didn't tell Diane. Adelson was completely unaware that she was in the pageant until she had already been accepted as an entrant. She played along though and ended up as a finalist. Unfortunately, she lost after the judges asked her whether she believed in God. Diane essentially responded that she was an atheist. As you can probably imagine, in southwest Texas in the mid-1960s, this answer went over like a fart in church. So I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I could read well. So He had me read for like an hour maybe. And sure enough, while we're there, you know, and I, we're reading all this thing, he wanted me to take my shirt off. And I was just like, mm-mm. No. After she understandably refused, Hal backtracked and claimed that the suggestion was just a test of her character. Yeah, okay. Just imagine being an actor on this shoot. You aren't getting paid. The shoots are all-nighters. The camera has to be reloaded every 20 minutes, and the director has no idea what he's doing and can't articulate what he wants from you. I don't recall any preparation. I mean, we just showed up and uh, they gave me instruction I think a lot of it was thought out at the moment it was filmed. I really do. Things got so bad that as time went on, many of the actors and crew started derisively referring to the film as Mangoes, the Cans of Fruit. As the production finally started to wrap, Hal Warren had to start thinking about putting the entire thing together. The various issues, cutbacks, and problems during filming would coagulate as the film entered its post-production phase. Throughout the production of Manos, director Hal Warren had repeatedly assured his cast that any technical deficiencies would be fixed during editing. I do remember Hal often saying, um, you know, we'll fix it later, we'll fix it in, we'll fix it in the lab, or we'll fix it in editing. Or, I, I mean, the words I remember him saying often is, we'll fix it. Anyone who's ever worked in film or television production knows the oft-maligned adage, we'll fix it in post. Suffice to say, the editing of Manos did nothing to alleviate its numerous technical problems. Rob Guidry, the film's DP, worked at a local television station, which was where the film was edited. 
According to crew who were there, the entire edit of Manos was finished in about four hours. Remember, they're editing 16mm film, so this process is normally supposed to take approximately, uh, forever. They threw together a 70 minute feature film in four hours. And I do want to stress that this is purely anecdotal, they were also a little drunk at the time. Again, hearsay, but it would certainly explain a lot of the film's editing issues. Shots are held for an uncomfortable length of time. In many scenes, it feels like the film deliberately pauses for multiple seconds after each line is delivered. Well, Targo, which way is out of here? There is no way out of here. This might not sound like a lot, but over the course of a whole scene and then a whole movie, it just makes the action drag and drag and drag. The film's most significant editing achievement is that it casts a time dilation spell over all who view it, making less than 70 minutes of runtime feel more like three hours. After first viewing this film, I originally thought that these long tapes were used as a means to bolster the meager running time. After researching its post-production, however, it seems more likely that these tapes were just slapped together haphazardly with minimal trimming. One of the worst offenders of the film's pacing problem is the opening sequence. Shots are left to linger on nothing and this sometimes goes on for a minute or more at a time. According to those who were present for the slapdash post-production process, Hal Warren intended to add credits during these long sequences of nothing, but either ran out of time or just plain forgot. One of the consequences of using a small handheld camera to shoot primarily at night was that getting critical focus of shots was difficult. This camera's viewfinder is very small and can be difficult to use. In these cases, a lot of cinematographers will use a tape measure to find focus by measuring the distance to the subject from the film plane. But the crew of Manos either didn't know how to do this or didn't bother. I refuse to believe that they did not have access to a tape measure. There are dozens of shots throughout the film that are completely out of focus. One of the most egregious being this close-up of the master during the film's climax. When the film went to editing, they'd only done so many takes of each scene, sometimes only doing one. They were forced to use the horribly out of focus shots in the final cut. Of course, possibly the most noticeable and pervasive of technical problems is the film's sound. The Bell and Howell camera used to film the picture could not record sound, and the production did not have a separate sound recording system. That means that absolutely every shot in Monos was shot MOS, silent. All sound had to be added in post-production. All of the male voices were dubbed by Hal Warren, Tom Naiman, John Reynolds, and William Jennings, one of the two cops in the film. All of the female voices were done by one person. All of the women in the film are dubbed over by one woman. She was a voice actress who did a lot of radio ads living in Dallas. Her name is unknown. She's not in the credits, but she does every voice. Not to mention the bare minimum of sound design. That's part of the reason for the film's strange, dreamlike atmosphere. The lack of any sound design makes it feel detached from reality. Darling, baby, you could have been hurt. Add in the ill-fitting, bizarre soundtrack, and you've got a sonic recipe for disaster. Despite the film's numerous issues, it should be noted that Hal Warren's bet was not to make a good film or even a competent one. He bet Sterling Silliphant that he could make a horror film, and he certainly did. On November 15th, 1966, the big premiere of Manos The Hands of Fate was held in the Capri Theater in El Paso. To give it the flair of a big Hollywood premiere, Warren rented a searchlight to shine into the sky and a limousine to ferry the cast to the theater. Unfortunately, he could only afford one limousine to carry everyone. So the limo would drop someone off, pull around to the back of the block, pick someone else up, and repeat. The premiere did not go well. Jackie Naaman Jones recalled crying when she heard a grown woman's voice start coming out of her mouth on screen. Diane Adelman recalls openly laughing at the film's technical failings. And Hal Warren himself called his creation the worst film ever made. Although he thought it could make a passable comedy if it was redubbed. I only disagree with this assessment insofar that I think it's already an amazing comedy. Arise, my wives, and hear the will of my nose. Despite the reception of the film being less than ideal, Warren still secured a short distribution run through Emerson Film Enterprises. 
The film was run on a number of drive-in screens and theaters in southwest Texas, but failed to generate any buzz. Given that none of the cast were ever paid any royalties, it's overwhelmingly likely that the film never actually broke even on its $19,000 budget. After this short theatrical run, the film faded into obscurity. It would be nearly 30 years before a mainstream audience would have the chance to see Manos again. Jackie Naaman Jones tried to find it while in college, but ultimately failed. Pat Taylor, the ex-wife of DP Rob Guidry, found the film listed as part of a catalog of films television stations could rent to broadcast over the air. It's likely that one of these television print copies was offered to Comedy Central in 1992, after which it ended up in a box sent to Frank Conniff, one of the showrunners of a program called Mystery Science Theater 3000. In the not too distant future, next Sunday, AD. Mystery Science Theater 3000 has a unique premise. Main character Joel, along with his trusty robot companions Crow and Tom Servo, is trapped on a satellite orbiting Earth. Mad scientist Dr. Forrester and his assistant, TV's Frank, send Joel the worst movies of all time, one by one, to see which one will drive him insane. To stave off insanity, Joel and the robots crack jokes and quips about the movies being shown, a process that came to be known as riffing. The majority of films shown on the program were in the public domain, making them freely available to be used, even commercially. And fortunately for the producers of the show, Manos is in the public domain, because Hal Warren neglected to include a copy copyright in the film's credits. The exact same thing that happened to George Romero's Night of the Living Dead just two years later. Does anybody have any Dramamine? Manos was aired as part of the series' fourth season finale on January 30th, 1993. It was an instant hit. The incredibly slow pace and baffling scenes led the normally collected and wisecracky hosts of the show to explode in frustration multiple times. <laughs> Yes, DO SOMETHING! Gah. <laughs> Eventually, during one of the break segments, the robots just start crying from the absurdity of the film they're watching. And for the first time in the show's history, Dr. Forrester apologizes to the main characters for sending such a horrible film. Look, I, uh, I, I just wanted to let you know, I know this movie's a tough one, and I just wanted to let you know I feel for you. I... Doctor? Caramel corn's ready, do you want it in your little mermaid ball? Uh, fine, sure. Torgo made a guest appearance and would become a recurring character during the rest of the series' run. The Manos episode of Mystery Science Theater became known as one of the best of the series among fans, and catapulted Manos out of obscurity and into B-movie cult status. After the release of the episode on DVD in 2001, the cult of Manos spread even further. Since the mid-2000s, a number of parodies, fan films, and other derivative creative works have appeared. The film status as public domain allows for the free distribution and commercial commercialization of such works. Multiple fan-made sequels have been announced. Manos, The Search for Valley Lodge was announced in 2010, but ultimately canceled in 2014. A prequel called Manos, The Rise of Torgo was released in 2015 to mostly good reception from the fan community. In the mid-2000s, a series of stage shows and musicals based on the film were also staged across the country, the most famous being the Seattle-based puppet show, Manos, The Hands of Felt. Have you seen Debbie? No. Oh, there are countless fan works inspired by Manos, artwork, music, even an 8-bit video game released for iOS devices. The fan community surrounding the film is creative and diverse, united by their shared enjoyment of Hal Warren's bizarre, unintentionally hilarious cult classic. Unfortunately, in the 2010s, something happened that threatened to end the free enjoyment of Manos forever. In 2011, a Florida State film student named Ben Solovi stumbled upon a work print of Manos the Hands of Fate. A work print is what comes back from a lab after a negative is developed and it's used to do the editing for a film before the negative itself is edited. Other than the camera negative itself, this is the next best thing to have if you want to restore an old film digitally, which is exactly what Solovi intended to do. After successfully raising $48,000 for the project via Kickstarter, Solovi digitally restored and released the film as Manos Special Edition through Synapse Films. That version is what you've been seeing throughout this video. This is what the original work print looks like. The project was obviously a big success. The restoration looks great, and it attracted a lot of positive attention. However, it also attracted the attention of Joe Warren, son of Manos director Hal Warren. Joe must have become aware of how much money and positive attention was coming in, and now wanted not just a piece of the action, 
but the entire pie. Representing Hal Warren's estate, Joe Warren filed a trademark application for Manos the Hands of Fate in October of 2016. He claimed ownership of the property by virtue of his father filing a copyright with the Library of Congress for his original screenplay, then titled The Fingers of Fate, despite the finished film not having a copyright. A successful trademarking of the property would allow him to demand royalty from derivative works or else demand that they cease and desist. This sparked a massive backlash from not only the Manos fandom, but the B-movie fan community at large. In response, an effort was made to resist the filing of the trademark, largely spearheaded by Jackie Naaman Jones. A petition was created, a GoFundMe campaign was started to raise money for the legal battle to come, and in mid-2017, fans of the film filed an official opposition letter against the trademark attempt. As of the writing of this video, the status of the trademark application remains unresolved. Its current status is listed as Code 807SU, which is trademark ease for a non-final notice has been sent to the trademark applicant with regards to their statement of use. Basically, the trademark office has taken issue with Joe's statement of intended use of the trademark. Based on the date the notice was sent, he has to reply by November of this year. It doesn't mean the trademark application is dead, but if the reaction of Jackie Naaman Jones is any indication, it isn't going to be a problem. She released a Mono sequel, Manos Returns, in May of this year. The most fascinating of stories can come from the most unscrupulous of places. Manos The Hands of Fate on its own has virtually no artistic merit as a film. It's slow and plodding, poorly written, and on a technical level displays no competency whatsoever. Despite that, a passionate and vibrant fan community has sprung up around the film, producing dozens of incredible creative works. Springing up also is a debate over the nature of copyright. And, more specifically, who exactly a collection of fictional work truly belongs to in the absence of a copyright. A great blog article I found on the case lays out the particulars in much greater detail, and I highly encourage you to check it out if you enjoy the legal nitty gritty part of this. Joe Warren's main claim looks like this. While the film Manos is not copyrighted, this is not in dispute. The screenplay it was produced from is. Works produced before 1978 normally do not have automatic copyright protection, but thanks to the Copyright Renewal Act, Hal Stripped received automatic protection until 2061. The other thing that substantiates this claim is that the work print that Ben Solovey found and subsequently restored had the title Fingers of Fate on the leader. It was misspelled, but still, that's pretty clear. It's a fairly legitimate claim, to be fair. On the other side, no one has been able to produce the complete screenplay under the copyrighted title. It is therefore unknowable whether the content of the film is sufficiently derivative of the screenplay that was copyrighted. Time is another factor. Joe Warren filed for a trademark of the film 50 years after it was initially released, after trying and failing to extort payment from creators of derivative fan works. Without wading too deep into the weeds on this issue, my personal view is this. The most compelling reason to keep Manos in the public domain is that without its public domain status, it is likely it would have never been seen again after its initial screening run. The legal ability to freely distribute, remake, and remix the film led to a huge spike in its popularity. These fan works are creative, expressive, and showcase a genuine passionate adoration for the source material. Allowing one person to be the gatekeeper for such projects just plain stinks to me. Making money is not what makes those projects special. It's the collaborative and familial nature of them that reflects a community's shared experience. As for the film itself, it is genuinely difficult to recommend you view Manos the Hands of Fate by yourself even one time. This is definitely a group watch where you can throw jokes at the screen while characters are standing around looking at each other. If anything, watch the film so that you can then watch The Hands of Felt right afterwards and get all the jokes. What is much more interesting to me about this film is the devotion it has inspired in its fans, and the personal meaning it holds for the cast and crew who made it. I imagine that now the cast can look at the film, now lovingly restored, they can think about good times with John Reynolds. Tom Naiman unexpectedly passed away in 2016, and now his daughter Jackie has an immortal document that stands as a memorial and celebration of his life. Hal Warren made a crappy movie, but he also, however inadvertently, brought thousands of diverse people together. Personally, I think that is worthy of praise. But yeah, the movie's a real stinker, so make sure you have a few beers handy.
Thank you so much for watching, and be on the lookout soon for more content like this. If you liked the video, hated the video, leave a suggestion below and let's start a discussion. Thanks!